we're going to be talking through the principles of natural selection, which is concept one, um, and this is going to be for the CP class. And something I really want to encourage you, especially if you have the physical PowerPoint, if you look in the notes section, you'll see um, there's a link to a website. It's called evolution.berkeley.edu. It's just a really good online resource um, for anything related to the evolution unit. So as we're going through anything, if there's anything that's confusing to you, check out that resource because it'll be another really good place for you to look to get some background information and to hear things again, not just from me. So first, we need to know what evolution is. That's what this whole unit is about. And evolution is the process of biological change that makes descendants differ from their ancestors. And so we really see two types of this. Um, microevolution and macroevolution. So microevolution, micro means small. So this is evolution on a really small scale, looking at just a single population of individuals evolving. So for instance, we can see microevolution in our lifetime by looking at populations of bacteria um, in, in defined spaces and seeing how they evolve over time, especially since bacteria reproduce very quickly. Whereas macroevolution, macro means large, and that is large-scale evolution. So that's talking about species, multiple populations um, evolving and changing over time. So that would be like we're going to see how <clears throat> there is fossil evidence that whales have evolved from land mammals. So that would be an example of macroevolution, how that entire species um, of whales has changed over time. We're going to do a little bit of looking at both of these. But as you can see from the definition of evolution in micro and macro, we are not in any way talking about the origin of life. That's a really big misconception that evolution is all about the origin of life. And that's really not the case. Evolution is about relatedness between species, and it's about change. And so that's what we're really going to be looking at through this unit. So... What was believed before? If you want a lot of details, you can go and listen to the video for Concept 1 for honors. But just some background info, um, most of science was built on religious beliefs um, for hundreds of years. And so creationism and the idea that um, all things are fixed, all species are fixed, and they are unchanging connects to the um, beliefs of creationism. And then Lamarck was the first big one to say something different. He believed uh, or came up with the idea of the inheritance of acquired traits. So he basically thought that organisms could evolve in their lifetime. And this um, may sound silly, but again, genetics, what you know about genetics was not around when he was. So he thought that if organisms change in their lifetime, those traits that they acquired could be passed on to their kids. So for instance, giraffes, have gotten such long necks because in their life long, in their lifetimes they would stretch their necks and then pass on a longer, more stretched neck to their children. Now we know that isn't the case. Um, you know, you can do CrossFit and work out every day and have a 12 pack and that doesn't change your genes. You don't pass on a 12 pack to your children. You know, your baby, if you do CrossFit, your baby's not gonna be born with a 12 pack. It's born with whatever traits it has based on your genes. And so that's kind of, once we learn more about genetics, um, Lamarck was disproved in that idea. Um, Cuvier, he um, came up with a theory of catastrophism, so the idea that um, changes in Earth um, match changes, um, drastic changes that have happened to Earth um, ge geologically. Um, Hutton and Lyle were kind of the opposite of that. Theirs was the idea of uniformitarianism, so everything is gradual and everything is connected and changing slowly over time through slow gradual changes to environments. Intelligent design is um, really a more sciencey way of saying creationism. It's basically saying that there is some that things are intelligently designed and that there is some creator but it's not specifically naming a god. Um, and then though we had Darwin who um, kinda came in and kinda rocked everyone's world. He was an English naturalist. He loved to study nature. And he went on a voyage to the Galapagos Islands. And while he was there on these different islands, he observed that different species of finches, which are um, like these little birds, 
also different species of tortoises and beetles and all these other organisms. But he looked at these different species and saw that they all looked different on different islands and they had adapted specific traits for the specific island environment that they inhabited. And he used all these observations to develop his theory of natural selection. And natural selection is the mechanism for how evolution occurs. It explains how evolution happens. So it's really important you understand that Darwin did not come up with evolution. That was an idea that scientists had been hypothesizing about for a while. But Darwin was the first one to explain how it actually went, goes down. And so there's some principles to natural selection, but first we need to know what it is. Natural selection, it says that some organisms will survive and reproduce better than others. And this will cause changes in the population over time by acting on traits that are heritable. So remember, we're not acting on acquired traits, the traits that are in your genes that you already have may be better than the genes that someone else has, and natural selection is gonna act on those. And it's summarized by the idea of survival of the fittest. So fitness is how well you fit into your environment, how suited you are for surviving and reproducing in it. So survival of the fittest says those that are best fit into their environment will live longer and hopefully reproduce more and be passing on their traits more. Thus, their genes and their traits should become more common over time. And there's four principles that kind of um, back this up. Some people break it down into five principles for the number doesn't really matter, but there's several principles that really help us to understand natural selection that Darwin detailed in his book. And first is the idea of overproduction of offspring. There are more offspring than there are resources. So because of this, we have limited resources. Whenever there's limited resources, that creates competition for those resources. Then within those organisms, there's variation. So within that overproduction of offspring, there's differences in the physical traits of the organisms, like you can see alone in these flowers. And the, that variation comes from random mutations, which this is the ultimate source. Um, it comes from genetic recombination during meiosis, so crossing over during prophase one can create some new variations and new combinations of genes. And it also can come from migration, gene flow. So not just moving somewhere new, but moving and then reproducing with the organisms that are there. That introduces new genes and creates some new combinations as well. Now, random mutations is the ultimate source because asexual reproducers like bacteria, they don't do meiosis and they don't, the migration doesn't affect them because they aren't sexually reproducing. They only reproduce on their own. So that's why we say this is the ultimate source because it affects all species regardless and all organisms regardless of um, reproduction. Adaptations are another principle of natural selection. And an adaptation, that is a noun. It is not a verb. It's not a thing that you can do. It's a trait or feature that you have that makes you better at surviving in your environment. So not every trait you have is an adaptation, but some traits are. For instance, you know, cacti like these have adaptations. They are able to store water in ways that other organisms can't. And they have, um, you know, these alternate pathways um, for doing photosynthesis so that they, um, you know, don't lose too much water, those kinds of things. And what we should see is that the best adaptation should become more common over time because organisms that have the best adaptation should be living longer, thus they're able to reproduce more, thus they're passing on their genes more. And so this will eventually change the gene pool. The gene pool are all the combined alleles of all individuals in a population. So if we're looking at all the genes of individuals in a, in a, of ducks in a pond, the gene pool would be, you know, all those different options. Well, we should see that gene pool change. You know, let's say an adaptation of being a yellow duck is favorable to being a brown duck. Um, so what we should see over time is that yellow ducks are living longer because of their adaptation, thus they're reproducing more, thus the genes for yellow are, should become more common in our gene pool than the genes for orange. That's what we're talking about here in natural selection. And it's natural because nature, the environment, is dictating what is the best traits for survival. And then last but not least is descent with modification, which is kind of fancy words and here's what it means. It means that gene frequencies can change over time. So looking at frequencies or 
how common the genes are in that gene pool, that can change over time. And natural selection should lead to populations with new phenotypes adapted to new situations. And these new phenotypes don't come from anywhere. I mean, they're not random unless it was a mutation. They tend to come from ancestors. And beneficial traits should become more common over time, which means descendants can be modified from the ancestors they came from such as things like opposable thumbs in certain primates, that kind of thing. A beneficial trait like an opposable thumb should become more common over time according to principles of natural selection. So why do these allele frequencies in the gene pool change and how do we end up with even more genetic variation? Um, Remember, microevolution is evolution on a small scale affecting one population, and there's three mechanisms we kind of see to um, create microevolution. Genetic drift, gene flow, and then non-random mating or sexual selection. So first is genetic drift. Um, this is random change in the frequency of alleles of a population over time. So it's just something that can randomly happen. And rare alleles will just decrease in frequency, and then the other alleles will increase in frequency. And we see this having a bigger effect in smaller populations. And if you're in my class, I'll do a little demonstration with a deck of cards to kind of show you this effect. But we can kind of see it in this picture as well. So if you look at this first picture, let's say if only the circled flowers randomly just get to reproduce for whatever reason, look at what could happen over time. So in the original population, you know, we have 80% eight, um, of the population is red flowers, 20% is white flowers. Let's say the red allele is dominant to the white. So we don't know if these are heterozygous or homozygous um, dominant, but they're showing the dominant phenotype. And natural selection acts on phenotypes. And so let's say some, you know, environmental things happen and only these three organisms are able to reproduce. And again, it's random change. Okay, so the next generation, what we would see is 30% of the population ends up being um, white and 70% ends up being red. Well, let's say, and again, just a random selection of organisms are, are able to reproduce, and then we can see that we'd end up with a population that's all red. So rare alleles, sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze, um, such as the recessive allele for white become less frequent and others become more dominant. And again, it's, it's just a random change, and again, it would be much more effective in a small population, have a much bigger effect in a small population. Another mechanism of microevolution is gene flow, and this is basically the movement of genes into or out of a population. So it's basically migration, but it's not, again, it's not just migration because you have to also, once you migrate, you have to also reproduce with the other organisms there in order to introduce your genes. Just moving somewhere doesn't introduce your genes to any anybody. And what it does is it results in an increase in genetic variability in a population. So if we have an island and it has only yellow beetles and another island only has blue beetles and some of these beetles get on a rowboat that some kids rowing and make their way over to this island, we've now introduced genes for blue, um, blue beetles and that'll start changing um, this population of beetles. Again, this is microevolution. It's small scale. It's not affecting beetles all over the world, just the beetles on this specific island and this specific population. Um, and then we have sexual selection, or also known as non-random mating. This is so interesting. This is actually the selection of traits that aren't necessarily good for survival fitness, but without them, you can't pass on your genes at all because you can't reproduce. So this is when nature, the environment, isn't dictating what traits make you best at survival, but sex is, where you have to have certain traits in order to be able to reproduce at all. And in nature, organisms really care about reproducing. And a really good example is male peacocks. They have these elaborate displays of color, and they have this elaborate detail in their feathers that female peacocks don't. And this clearly inhibits their survival because it makes them stand out to predators and, and weighs them down when they're flying because their feathers are much longer too. But if they don't have this, they aren't able to reproduce and pass on their genes. And thus, sexual selection is favored having this trait. Um, and there's a really cool video, if you have my PowerPoint in the link section of this notes, um, you fast forward to a section of it that'll give you about an eight minute spiel about peacocks and the actual experiments they did behind to prove it, which is really, really cool. Now, evolution is not always happening necessarily. 
If it wasn't happening, we would say that a population is in genetic equilibrium. And there's a lot of math that goes with this. Um, it's called the Hardy-Weinberg principle, which I'm going over with the honor students, but not with y'all. So do you know that there is math to this? To back this up, but genetic equilibrium would be when there are no changes in the allele frequencies of a population, meaning that evolution is not occurring. But there's five things that have to be true in order for evolution not to happen and in order for a population to be in genetic equilibrium. First, the population has to be very large in order to eliminate the effects of potential genetic drift. Second, there can be no migration in order to eliminate the effects of potential gene flow. Third, there has to be random mating, so no selection whatsoever in your mating, it's just random, in order to negate the effects of potential sexual selection or non-random mating. Four, there can be no mutations, because we know mutations create variation. And then five, there can be no natural selection, so no traits can be more favorable for survival than others. So the purpose of this, as you can see, is that this is really, really, really hard to meet all five of these conditions. And pretty much in any situation, you'll see that one of these conditions being violated. Thus, that means that evolution is probably occurring in some way, even if we can't see it. And that is Concept One Notes for CP students.